What do grades and test scores tell us? What don't they tell us? These questions are frequently discussed and debated among teachers, principals, parents, policymakers, and researchers. And just in the last week, news articles on grades versus grade level learning and the value of the SAT have raised even more questions. Grades and tests each offer information. Let's review what the research says about both. I'm Maureen Kelleher, Editorial Director with Future Ed, an, an independent, solution-oriented think tank. Previously, I was an education reporter and a Chicago high school teacher. I'm happy to be here today with Elaine Allensworth, the Lewis Sebring Director of the University of Chicago Consortium on School Research. I have a few questions for you, Elaine. Let's dive in on this short Q&A about what grades and standardized tests can tell us about students' future outcomes. First off, how important are course grades as predictors of students' future success? Well, if you are just going to focus on one indicator for assessing students' academic readiness, grades provide the most comprehensive information. So if we look at the overall population of college going students, their course grades are consistently the strongest indicators of how they'll perform in college or the next grade level. Um, standardized tests like the SAT and the ACT, they provide some additional information. So we've seen this in studies we've done at the U Chicago Consortium in research we're doing right now, um, and also in studies done nationally. Um, and we can provide links to that research for folks. Um, this really matters because it affects where we put our effort for supporting students. So are we focused on making sure students are highly engaged in their classes, despite whatever barriers they have? And students have a lot of barriers that they need support with. Um, so are we making sure that they can be engaged in class and get good grades? Or are we spending a lot of time preparing students to take standardized tests? Ultimately, efforts to support student engagement in their classes is gonna have a bigger impact on their later success. Thank you. That's a really important thing to know. Why is it that some research might say something different? So I know that right now people are talking about research that was recently covered in a New York Times opinion piece, um, and it focused studies and drew different conclusions than, than what I just said. Um, but there are a few reasons for that. I mean, first of all, the main examples were drawn from a study that was not designed to compare grades versus tests. And you know, the authors of that study noted their findings only apply to the elite Ivy League colleges attended by students in their sample, not the general population. And that's important because the vast majority of students are not going to Ivy League schools. Um, second, the Ivy League sample and um, also the sample in the other study that was noted in the piece, um, which was based on University of California schools, uh, they have a restricted range of GPAs. You know, at Ivy League schools, they admit students based on their high school GPAs. So if you look at their average GPA, it's probably around a 3.9 or very close to a 4.0. Um, so once you have those very small differences in high school grades, you know, there's just, you're not gonna find a relationship between grades and other outcomes um, because there's just not a lot of difference between students. And so the more that colleges are selecting students on grades, which is happening more and more as colleges become increasingly test optional, uh, the harder it is to find a relationship. Um, and then another issue uh, is that many of the studies that show weaker relationships of GPAs with college outcomes use GPAs that aren't solely based on students' grades. Um, they often use weighted GPAs, like the University of California study. Um, and weighted GPAs confound grades with the types of courses that students take, when it's really the grades that matter much more, how students perform in their courses. Weighted GPAs are often very inflated based on the courses students take. Um, so they're weaker signals of college readiness than unweighted GPAs. Um, there are also many studies that use self-reported GPAs instead of uh, GPAs from transcripts, and those are also less accurate. Gotcha. So why might grades be more predictive of students' later success than standardized tests? Yeah, so standardized tests provide particular types of information about students' skills and content knowledge, which is useful. Um, but most of what students learn in school is not on standardized tests. 
Um, standardized tests also reward particular ways of showing knowledge, such as being able to answer short questions quickly under time pressure, which some students do really well, um, but those students may not do as well on, say, complex long-term assignments, um, questions that don't just have one answer, where other students may excel better. Um, I think of standardized tests as like measuring sprint times for soccer players. So they can tell you something about the player's abilities in a standardized way that you can measure consistently from place to place. Um, but grades are more like the full scouting report. So seeing how a player performs on a field or interacts with their teammates, it might not be as systematic as seeing how fast they run 100 meters. Um, and it might be influenced by who they're playing and the conditions of the field but it's gonna provide you with a lot more information overall about their ability to play soccer. That's, that's a great analogy. Um, so then there are other concerns about grades too. What about grade subjectivity? Individual teachers can have a lot of freedom in determining grades. So how do you factor that in? Yeah, there are differences in grading practices and standards across teachers and schools, clearly. Um, but there's also subjectivity in terms of what test makers decide to include on standardized tests. I think sometimes people forget that. Um, anything you measure has error. So even your height fluctuates from the beginning to the end of the day, and it could be different based on who's measuring it and how. Um, the measurement error of a standardized test score, um, for example, is often equivalent to half of a year of learning. So if you take the same test on a different day, you might get a very different score. Uh, just like if you had a different teacher, you might get a different grade. Uh, the issue um, becomes whether those differences in grades across teachers are bigger than the differences in academic skills across students so that we're not getting um, accurate enough measurement. But since study after study shows that across all students, grades are very predictive, those differences across teachers have to be minor relative to students' actual academic preparation. And we're wrapping up a study right now that looks specifically at those differences. Um, also, grade point averages, GPAs, um, they average out all those differences across teachers because they combine grades from multiple classes. You know, some classes might have been easier or harder. So you get a better overall assessment of students' academic performance. And GPAs are better indicators of students' preparation for future academic work beyond their grade in an individual class. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. But at the same time, there's a lot of conversation in the education space now about grade inflation. So what about grade inflation and how does it fit in the picture? Yeah, well, um, I do think we need to separate out pre-pandemic and post-pandemic years here. Um, I've seen a lot of articles decrying the fact that the average high school graduate has an A average or the median grade at an Ivy League school is an A. Um, but you can't really know that grade inflation has occurred just because grades are higher. I mean, students could be working harder, learning more, the college could be selecting more higher achieving students over time, or people could be reporting on weighted GPAs instead of actual grades. Um, to know whether grades are inflated, you really need to examine their relationship with performance at a later time to see if they're less predictive than they used to be. You can also get a sense of how likely grades might be inflated by looking at other indicators of student effort and learning. Um, so one common practice is to compare changes in grades to changes in test scores. I do tend to take these comparisons when made in isolation with a grain of salt um, because grades and test scores measure different aspects of academic performance. So you can have one improve without the other changing. And we have seen that in the past where we've seen improvements in grades that were not mirrored in test scores with no decline in the predictiveness of GPAs. Um, but post-pandemic, um, course grades have not declined. And we've not only seen declines in test scores, but also in attendance and in students' reports on surveys about the level of challenge in their classes and how hard they have to work. Um, and so that says to me that students and teachers are really struggling with changes that are happening society-wide that have affected student engagement in school. And I do think this has affected the ways that teachers are currently grading students. Um, 
you know, there's been a lot of emphasis on getting students' math scores up after the pandemic, but it is at least as critical and probably more critical to figure out how to get students back to coming to school every day, engaged in learning, with teachers feeling like they have the supports they need to fully engage students and maintain high expectations for learning. Thanks. That's a really important point. Where can folks learn more about all these issues? So we'll provide links and references to the studies I mentioned. Um, we're also working right now on a report that compiles this information in greater detail for educators, parents, and leaders. So look for that later this year. That's great. And then at Future Ed, for, for schools and districts who are interested in trying to figure out how to get students back to school every day, we would we would encourage them to take a look through our attendance playbook, which has a whole range of research-backed and road-tested strategies uh, working whole school or with higher needs students. So we hope you'll take a look at those too. Elaine, thank you so much for sharing the findings from your research and all this great context to help people understand how grades and test scores can help us on, can help us envision where students are going after they leave high school. It's really helpful in this moment, especially. Oh, thank you, Maureen. Thanks for chatting.